Francis uh, de Toit, who translated the Mirror uh, Translation Bible, told of a story of a black eagle that had been uh, in captivity in a zoo for about 10 years. Uh, the natural conservation officer and team was finally uh, excited, so excited to be able to release this eagle in the wild. Uh, the eagle arrived in a wooden crate. They took it to the spot where they were going to release it and set it free. And they opened the cage, and to their disappointment, the eagle just remained in the cage. It refused to come out of the cage. It had been in the cage for about 10 years in the zoo. Finally, it came to this time to where it was going to be set free. They opened the door, and nothing happened. They were just so disappointed, so they tried to do everything that they could to get the eagle to come out of the cage and, and, to, and to fly. And so for hours, they just spent, and nothing happened. The eagle just remained in the cage until there was a moment that there were some other eagles that began to soar over that area, and they began to cry out. And instantly, the eagle, when it heard in the cage the eagles overhead calling out to him, the eagle came out of the cage and, boom, launched up and began to soar. Now, to me, this just gives an, an incredible imagery of the prison gates that have been swung open wide for us, but yet many times we make the choice to remain in, in, in the comfort of the cage that we have been so used to instead of getting out and soaring. The clarity of the message of Jesus Christ is to announce to the nations with bold confidence our original identity in him and our mirror-reflected innocence in him. You see, if the gospel is not the voice of the free eagle, it's not the gospel. The gospel, the good news, is that he has come to set every captive free. Now, what I want to do, I want to go uh, start in the book of Romans, chapter number 1. Uh, last week, we, we began to talk about the vision, the encounter that John Paul Jackson had had about 18, 19 years ago. And in this encounter, he was caught up into the heavenlies. And as he was there, the angel of the Lord began to instruct him on the upcoming uh, move of God that was going to come and going to manifest in the churches and in the nations. And the angel of the Lord began to instruct him and told him, he said, uh, in, in, in the book of Romans lies the keys to the manifestation of the end time outpouring of the Spirit of God on all flesh. And he said, said, especially you need to look in Romans chapter number four because there are many principles that are not being put into application that needs to be applied in the body of Christ today. And he saw in this, in this encounter, in this large uh, open room, that there were seats like in a stadium and there were four different levels. And and, and he said uh, on row number one and row number two were, were ministers and uh, ministers who nobody would know, who nobody would recognize. Then on the third row, there were many ministers that people would easily recognize. They would easily be able to see them and, and know instantly who they were. But then there was a fourth row that was totally empty. He said the angel Lord spoke to him and said that fourth row has been emptied since the first church, since the first century church. And, 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 and he said the divine pecking order in the church was about to change. In other words, there were people who, who were not known, who were not recognized on the first and second levels, who were about to be catapulted over the people on the third row benches into that fourth row area that people had not been in that level since the first century church. 
people who you would not know, who you would not recognize, who are not known for maybe particular gifts or talents or abilities, but these were people who would be known as carriers of the presence of the Lord. It is my pleasure and privilege to tell you I believe that God wants to raise up a generation of people who will operate the high, in the highest levels, who will function in the levels of operating in his presence, who will be known for carriers of his presence in this day. Romans chapter number one, verse number 16, Paul says it like this. He said, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Because it is God's power for salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and also to the Greek, for in it is God's righteousness revealed from faith to faith. The just, as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Now let's focus on that verse number 16 again. I am not ashamed of the gospel. I am not ashamed of the gospel. The word gospel in the Greek language simply means God. Good news. In trying times, in dark days, we're still called to be the good news people. Come on now. We are the good news people. In, in, in the middle of, of, of a society and culture where uh, bad news is prevalent to, and everywhere you go, you don't have to turn far to go to hear all kinds of bad news. But in the midst of popularity of bad news, there is a good news people who is rising up in this hour and shining with the good news, the good news of the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. Once again, we're not the best bad news people. We are the good news people. And Paul said it like this, I'm not ashamed to declare the good news. In the middle of bad news, I wanted to pronounce, I am not ashamed to declare the good news. There is good news. God is still in the healing business. He's still in the saving business. He's still in the delivering business. He's still in the miracle work in business. He's not about to try to move us from bummer to bummer, but he's about to move us from faith to faith and from glory to glory. Come on now, we are the good news people. It's time to start sharing some good news, and the good news is that Jesus is still king. He's still Lord. So the question is, is what does this next level of glory look like? If he moves us from glory to glory, what does the next level of glory look like? If he moves us from faith to faith, what does this next level of faith look like? He said, he said, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. So if you have an opportunity to say something, what kind of good news are you going to share about what Christ has done and Christ is doing? In Luke chapter number 7, verse number 22, John came, uh, the disciples of John came to Jesus. And John had just been in prison. And the disciples of John came to Jesus and, and, and said, Jesus, John has sent us and we want to know, are you the Messiah? Are you the one who is to come? Are you the Messiah or should we look for another one? What's interesting is that just a couple of chapters earlier, John had prophesied to all of the people who were at the Jordan River. Some scholars say anywhere from 15 to 20,000 people could have been present while John was ministering and baptizing at the Jordan River. And when Jesus showed up, John the Baptist turns around and looks and says, there's the Messiah. There's the son of the living God. There's the one. There's the one who I've been prophesying prophesying about. There he is. But now just a few ch short chapters later, John was doubting the prophecy that he had already spoken and sent disciples to Jesus and saying, well, wait a minute, I might have missed it back here. So let's clarify a couple of things. Are you really the Messiah? Are you really the one? And Jesus makes a bold declaration and he said, tell John this. He says, the blind are seeing, the lame 
are walking. The lepers are cleansed. The deaf are hearing. The dead are raised. And the poor have the gospel preached to them. In other words, there is good news for the blind. The good news for the blind is that you can see. The good news for the sick is that you can be healed. The good news for the oppressed or the depressed is that you can be free. Every person, we have to understand, there is good news. And Paul said this in Romans 1.16, I am not ashamed of the good news because it's the power of God. There is a power from God that is released through the good news of what God has done and what God is doing. So verse 17 goes on to say, say it like this. He says, so the good news is, uh, the good news is, is that we, God's righteousness is revealed from faith to faith because the just live by their faith. Hebrews uh, 11 1 says it like this faith is the substance of things hoped for the evidence of things not seen in other words faith is the tangible reality of things that you dream about faith is the tangible reality of things that you're dreaming about but it's still in a vision form you say well pastor I just don't have that kind of faith Michael I just don't have that kind of faith well, what if I was to tell you that there is a higher level of faith that's available to you? It's called God's faith or the law of faith. You see, the law of faith is tapping into the faith that God has. You say, I just can't believe God for a miracle. I just can't believe God for circumstances to change. That's okay. There is a higher level of faith. There is a higher level of believing. And the book of Hebrews calls it the law of faith or tapping into God's faith. Mark eleven twenty two. we're told to have the faith of God. Or the literal translation is have the God kind of faith. How can I have the God kind of faith? James chapter number one, verses two through four says it like this. He says, count it all joy, brothers and sisters, when you fall into diverse temptations, when you engage in all kinds of trials, because it's the testing of your faith that produces patience or endurance. But endurance or patience must do its complete work so that you may be mature, complete, lacking nothing. In other words, the good news of James chapter number one is that a trial, when a trial comes, a trial is not coming to take something away from you. A trial is coming to add something to you. Man, that's good news. That's what James 1 says. A trial is not coming to take something from you. When we engage and we experience trials and tribulations and tests, we're worried about what am I going to lose? What is this going to cost me? But James had a higher understanding of what a trial does and the purpose of a trial. God does not allow a trial to come to you without an upgrade attached to it. Come on now, you ought to be shouting right there in your seat right now at home. You should just be rejoicing knowing that the trial comes not to take away from you, but the trial comes to add something to you. And we need to start meditating when we start seeing trials, when we start seeing tests, when we start seeing adversity come, we ought to start asking the question, okay, Ask myself this, what kind of upgrade is attached to this? Because, watch this, the trial's not coming to take away from me. The trial is coming to add something. That's what he said in James 1, 2 through 4. The end of this is that you would be complete, lacking nothing. So the test is not coming to take something away. That's good news. The test is coming to add something to you. That's why he says, count it all joy. In other words, one of the ways that we partner with God is through joy. When you see a test, when you see a trial, one of the ways that you can instantly connect with God 
instantly you can just begin to partner with God and we partner with him through joy. And that's why he says count it all joy. Now, why did he say count it all joy? Because joy is not the first natural response when you see adversity. I mean, you just don't wake up one morning and, and your car tires, all four of them are flat and say, woohoo, all my tires are flat. This is great. When you see advert, when you look at your bank account and it says, oh, you are overdrawn, $195.32. Your initial response is not, wow, this is great. No, he says, <laughs> come on now. But he says one of the ways that we can partner with God in adversity is through joy. Well, laughter is a byproduct of the joy. So we partner with God with God through our joy and we start counting it. My natural response was to be to get mad, to be frustrated uh, when I see adversity. But instead of that, I'm going to count it all joy because the trial and the adversity can't show up without an upgrade that's attached to it. And he says, when patience has matured, advanced inside of you, it takes you to a place to where you are lacking nothing. But look at the process of getting to that place to where you have no lack, lacking nothing. It shows up in the midst of a trial that has an upgrade attached to it that you have to access through joy. And the question is, is can we Keep our joy. Nehemiah 8 and 10 says it like this. He said, it's the joy of the Lord that is your strength. So go ahead right now. Do a practice test. Smile just as big as you possibly can. Smile just as big. Look around. If anybody's real close to you, look around. Show them your teeth or your lack of teeth. Or just, just go ahead and, and just begin to say and think in your mind, I am partnering with God in the midst of my circumstance through joy because I know that there is a divine upgrade that is attached to this right here. Woo, man, now I can breathe just for a second. Say, well, okay, pastor, I still can't go to that level of faith. So what am I supposed to do? Okay, let's back it up again. Let's back it up. Can you believe that God loves you? Because faith works by love. And if faith is not working, then we got to start backing up and see, okay, I got to do a love check on me right now. Am I receiving the Father's affirmations for me? Am I receiving his love? Because I can't be rooted and grounded in his love that produces faith. I cannot be rooted and grounded in his love and faith not be a byproduct of that because faith works by love. So, got to start working on that love walk now. Come on. <clears throat> so, let's look at this. Let's look at this. So, we begin to take time and we start meditating. How much does God love me? Well, if you ever wonder how much he loves you, just go to John chapter number three, verse number 16, and that's a good starting point. God loved you so much that he gave his son for you. Imagine, I, I love you. I love a lot of people. I, I try, to, try to love everybody. Watch this, but I am not about to sacrifice my son for your purpose. If God did not withhold, Paul said it like this, if God did not withhold his own son, how shall he not freely give us all things? God's not trying to hold you back from something. He's trying to get something to you and through you. So that's why we can count it all joy. So we start meditating on just how much that he loves us. Start meditating on us in Christ, in Christ in us, and Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father. And if you are in Christ, where does that put you? We start meditating and exploring the possibilities 
of being in Christ and Christ in us. What does it look like? Christ, number one, we know that Christ is awesome, right? He's brilliant. He's majestic. He's full of wonder. And if you are inside of him, that should make you somewhat brilliant yourself. That should make you somewhat wonderful yourself. Oh, you're not ready to go to that level? Okay, just begin to back up then and just meditate on how awesome and how beautiful the Lord Jesus is and how much that he loves you. In Romans chapter number one, verse number one, Paul identifies himself as called to be an apostle. And he identifies the people of Rome called to be saints. Verse number seven, he said, to all in Rome who are called to be saints. Now, <laughs> watch this. Paul knew what his calling was and what he was called to do. And he had a way of calling others up to a higher level of living. He called the people in Rome saints when they weren't acting like saints. The question is, 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 can we call people up to their identity instead of calling them out for their issues? It's really easy to call somebody out for their issues, but it's another level to call them up to their identity. That's what fathers do. Fathers call people out. Fathers and mothers call people out, up to their identity and not on their issues. Not to say that there's some issues that won't have to be called out, but our primary function is not to call out issues, but it's to call people up above the issue. So before they were acting like saints, he called them saints. The second thing that he did, he said, he said you are greatly loved. To those who are in Rome, you are greatly loved. Now, imagine this. He's speaking to a city, pronouncing how much God loves them and how much God loves that city and how much he loves the people in it in a time when Nero was taking Christians and impaling them and setting them on fire like torches lining the roads up with Christian bodies. We think that we're going through trials and tribulations now. It is nothing compared to what some of the saints around the world have experienced through history. But in the middle of the madness of King Nero, in the middle of the madness of Christians being impaled and set on fire, lining the streets of the, of, uh, into Rome, in the middle of all of that, Paul gets up and announces, he said, I want to show you how much love God has for this city. If that would have been modern day times, a modern day apostle or a prophet would start talking about how much God hates that city and how much God, we're not good. Let's not get into that. Let's not get, he began to call them up to a place of higher living, declaring the goodness of God. Let's go on. Let's go on. You see, you see, we are called to be saints. What I was noticing in, in this study is that God places a higher priority on saints than he does the leaders. Did y'all hear the crickets right there? He puts a higher priority. The authors of the 27 books of the New Testament, all of them address their writing to the saints. Not one of the books were addressed to one of the fivefold ministers. Now, if I were to write letters to all of the church members of other churches without first addressing the pastor... Do you realize what kind of trouble I would get into? But, but we see all 27 letters of the New Testament were not addressed to fivefold ministers. They were addressed to the saints. Why? Because God puts the highest priority on the saints, on the people, not the leadership. 
Watch this. I find it interesting that in Acts chapter number 8, in times of trouble and in times of adversity, the leaders, the fivefold, they were in Jerusalem debating doctrine while the saints were out in the world preaching the gospel, doing signs, wonders, miracles, and declaring the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The question is, is are we going to get locked in to doctrinal debates on who's right? Is circumcision for today or is it not? Do you got to become a Jew first before you can come saved? Do the Gentiles got to come in the way through Judaism before they can come to Christ? These were doctrinal questions that were being put out that they were being debated on and while leadership was debating doctrine the saints were out doing the work I'm here to tell you that it's time for the saints of God to arise it's the purpose of the fivefold to equip the saints for ministry you see we saw over the past hundred years we saw a great evangelistic movement we saw a pastor movement. We saw a teacher movement. We saw a prophetic movement. We saw an apostolic movement. And I want to declare before you that the next movement that we're going to see is going to be a saint's movement. Because the purpose of the fivefold is to equip the saints for ministry. Let me tell you, your Bible calls you a saint. Not because you did everything right, but because Jesus did everything right. And through your confession of Jesus Christ as Lord of your life, it's the blood that cleanses you and makes you whole. It's because Jesus did everything right, not because you did everything right. Start looking at yourself in that identity as a saint. You start telling people they come from monkeys, they're going to act like they come from monkeys. You start calling people that they are saints, they're going to start, you start calling people out according to the higher level of living. You start calling people out and saying, well, it's okay for you to be like you are. It's okay for you to be crazy. You didn't have a mom. You didn't have a dad. Your mom dropped you on your head when you was a baby. You did, you was born on the wrong side of the railroad tracks. You didn't get this opportunity. You didn't get that opportunity. You can focus on all of that or you can focus on God calls me a saint I'm going to come up to that level of living I'm not going to come and, 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 and humble myself to a lower level of living he said in Romans chapter number one that we are called to be saints you you and you you're called to be a saint this is the saint movement let me tell you what the Bible says there's hundreds of scriptures that pertain to this and I've narrowed it down to about uh, 20 different categories I'm not going to probably go over all of them but I could <laughs> but watch this the first thing that I want to talk about is that saints are possessors they possess the kingdom Daniel 7 18 Daniel said it like this the saints of the most high will take the kingdom and they will possess the kingdom forever and ever and ever. Look at the possessions that belong to the saints. Identified in Christ as a saint, Daniel prophesied that it's going to be the saints that take the kingdom or it's going to be the saints that manifest the kingdom of God. That is at hand. Uh, the second thing that we see in Daniel chapter number 7, verse number 22, it's the saints that get justice. Daniel 7, 22, it says, Until the Ancient of Days came, justice, judgment was given to the saints of the Most High until the saints possessed the kingdom. It's a great injustice for a believer to have sickness in their body. That's an injustice. It's an injustice for you to have lack. That's an injustice. Why? Because Jesus paid the price for you to have complete healing and wholeness in your body. Nothing missing, nothing lacking, nothing broken. So when we begin to meditate, it's a great injustice. You see, a lot of times when we start talking about justice, believers 
won't really start praying and pressing in for justice because they're reminded of the injustices in their life. And really, if we don't believe that we're forgiven for the injustices that we have been involved in, we won't cry out to God for justice. But when we understand I am covered by the blood of Jesus, his blood covers me, his blood makes me whole, he makes me righteous, I am the righteousness of God in Christ, mm. Not because of what I've done, but because of what he's done. You can begin to cry out for justice. Watch this. If you are renting, if you are renting an apartment, if you're renting an apartment and you're three months behind on your payment and the stove breaks down, you're not about to call the landlord to come and fix that thing because you know, number one, I'm in the wrong here. And if I call the landlord about this issue that I'm having, then, uh, you know, he's going to press me even more for payment on the money that I owe or the air condition goes out or the refrigerator goes out. You're not going to be too likely to call because you know that you are in the wrong. But if your rent is paid in full and you got no bill right there with your landlord and there becomes an issue, why, wow, you just get right up on your phone with boldness and call the landlord and say, you better get up in here and fix this stove. You better get up in here and fix the air conditioner or the refrigerator. Why? Because you are in right standing. I'm here to prophesy to you and speak into your spirit today that because of Jesus Christ, you are in in right standing with God right now and the injustices against you can be redeemed as you go into and cry out to the Lord for justice. Daniel 7 25 says it like this. He reveals the battle strategy of the enemy against the saints. He says he's going to speak great words, Daniel 7, 25, great words against the Most High and begin to wear out the saints and think to change the times and the laws. And they shall be given unto his hand until a time and a times and a dividing of time. So in other words, the main strategy, the battle strategy of the enemy in the end of days is to wear you out out. He wants to absolutely wear you out. And, and the battle strategy of the enemy has already been revealed to us. His goal is to wear you out, to have you so busy doing so many other different things that you cannot focus and rest in the presence of the Lord. There is a remedy for tiredness, and it's called rest. The enemy wants to wear you out, but God wants to give you rest. The remedy, the remedy for this, the remedy, the remedy for the battle strategy of the enemy. Look in Daniel chapter 7, verse number 27. I could give you hundreds of of scriptures that tell you that are pertaining to saints and our identity in the sainthood of God that shows you battle strategies of the enemy, how that we overcome all every time and it's addressed to the saint. You see, you see, in, in from, from 500 A.D. to 1500 A.D., saints were identified as somebody who had already died and went on to heaven. But if you apply that definition to the biblical verses that are addressed to saints, we can see that that definition is inaccurate. Why would you write 27 books and address them to saints, people who are already dead. Makes no sense. Makes no sense. Daniel 7 and 27, here is the remedy. The kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven. 
That's the people on the earth right now. Shall be given to the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions serve and obey them. Watch this. The remedy is understanding the dominion that God has given to the saints. Whatever you bind on earth, bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth, loose in heaven. When are we going to start operating in kingdom dominion? Romans 8.27 says it like this. It's the Holy Spirit that makes intercession through you. Always praying according to the will of God by praying, praying in the Spirit. So to every saint of God makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Make space and time to pray in the Spirit. Allow Holy Spirit to begin to pray through you. 1 Corinthians 14 says that when we pray in the Spirit, we are praying out mysteries. Are these mysteries to God or are they mysteries to us? I'm convinced there's nothing a mystery for God. So if mysteries are being prayed out, there are things that are mystical to us or mysteries to us that are revealed as we begin to pray in the Spirit. Pray in the Spirit. Pray. Jude says it like you build up yourself in the most holy faith by praying in the Holy Ghost. When you are praying in tongues, you are praying in the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is searching the search engine of God better than Google. I mean the search engine of God fast Fast, searching the deep things of God, revealing to you what God has for you. Paul said in Ephesians 3, 8, he says, I consider myself the least of all of the saints. Ephesians 3, 18, that we may be able to comprehend with all the saints the breadth, the length, the depth, the height of the Lord's love, of God's love. See, comprehension or understanding is accessible to the saints. Ephesians 4, 12, uh, the fivefold is given for the perfecting of the saints, the work of ministry, the edifying of the body. You see, mature saints edify. Colossians 1.12, giving thanks to the Father, which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. We have this opportunity to receive inheritance in light as a saint of God. I'm going to end with this thought here. I've got about, I don't know, five or six more things that we could go through. But I'm going to end it right here with this. Jude chapter number one, verse number three says it like this. He says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write to you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write to you. I exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. He said, if you're going to contend, if you're going to fight, fight for the faith that was delivered to the saints. A lot of people talk about the faith of the things, that the, how they stepped out on faith to do certain things. In other words... I stepped out on faith to buy this house. I stepped out on faith to buy this car. I stepped out on faith to take this job. Watch this. That, that's not the kind of faith that he's saying to contend for. He's saying contend for the faith that was delivered to the saints. This is the faith that is, that is pressing in and contending and believing God for transformation in people's lives, for transformation in cities, for transformation in nations. He says, if you're going to contend, contend. If you're going to fight, fight for the faith that was delivered to the saints. If you're going to do this, you see, spiritual warfare 
is all about not knocking the devil out and the devil knocking you out and the devil getting back up and you getting back up and you going toe-to-toe. Spiritual warfare is not fighting the enemy on his terms. Spiritual warfare is in the midst of adversity, in the midst of contradictions, in the midst of adverse circumstances, choosing to focus on the majesty and the lordship of Jesus Christ, refusing, refusing to see anything but the glory and the majesty and the beauty of Jesus Christ, understanding that a a battle cannot show up without upgrades attached to it. When Goliath was coming out taunting Israel, one of the first things that David said to to his brothers and to the armies, he says, what kind of rewards are available to the man who takes this giant out? David understood that there are rewards and there are upgrades that are available in a battle. What we have to discern is, God, are you calling me to engage in this fight? Is, are you, call, you see, you don't accept every invitation to fight. You don't accept every. Somebody just wanting to fight everything and everybody. You don't accept. They're, ask yourself, what kind, of, what kind of upgrades are available in this? If there are no upgrades available in this, there's no point in engaging. <laughs> the faith delivered to the saints is faith for the manifestations of the kingdom of God. Faith delivered to the saints is the ability to call those things that are not as though they were. Faith delivered to the saints is to be fully persuaded that God is ready, that he is willing and he is able to show himself strong, to overwhelm and to wreck you with his goodness. What does it look like to you to be wrecked with the goodness of God? What does it look like to you to be overwhelmed by his kindness and his mercy? For some of you, it looks like complete healing and wholeness in your body. For some of you, it looks like restoration in your marriage or in your family. Begin to meditate what it looks like to be overwhelmed with the goodness of God. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. In other words, it's a vision inside of your mind. It starts. It's not made manifest yet, but that's the starting point. That's the starting point. See, operating out of the law of faith is not drawing and living out of your faith, but it's drawing, imagining, and living out of his faith. Maybe you don't have enough faith to believe in your faith that God can do something, but can you just believe that God's faith is enough to cover you? You see, we're called to be saints. We're called to be saints. And out of that revelation of righteousness, we begin to walk in holiness. We don't walk in holiness and then the byproduct of holiness is righteousness. No. Walking in righteousness, we start walking in righteousness and have that understanding of the revelation. I am the righteousness of God right now. Because of Christ Jesus, not because of my performance, not because of what I can do, not because of what I've already done, but because of what Jesus Christ has already done right now. I'm the righteousness of God. And the reality of the righteousness of God causes me, causes me to live a life of holiness. And that's what the word saint, one of the translations of the word saint is not just holy, not just dedicated, not just consecrated, but one of the definitions of the word saint is sanctuary. You see, when you understand that you are the sanctuary, you are the temple of God, Holy Spirit wants to dwell in you and fill you and rest upon you, breathe on you. You're called. 
You're called to be a saint. You're called to be a saint. So before we go, I am going to get my brother Craig to come up and to give us some final thoughts in closing. Maybe some prophecies. Maybe I don't know what he's going to do. It's whatever it's going to be. It's going to be good. It's going to be good. It's going to be good. Pastor Craig is the, the pastor at a Relationship Church, uh, a man who I respect greatly. And uh, just lend your ear as he comes with some final thoughts and closes out in prayer. Michael has mentioned several times about upgrading in a crisis. I'm going to give you some examples of that's happening the last six weeks, this crisis. And I'm going to give you some specific things to do so that when we exit this thing, at least in the state of Georgia, starting exiting now, especially by the end of the week when the shelter in places is over with, your upgrade is in motion. And it's, it, it revolves around what he's already said, rest. Hebrews 4.11 says, labor or strive, make an effort, depending on the version, into rest. Rest means many things. Now, we've been in a physical rest to some degree for a lot of people for the last six weeks. Bob Jones, the prophet, over 25 years ago in the 1990s, said the decade of the 20s, which we have just started, would be known as the decade of rest. How ironic is it that the entire world, by government mandate, has been put into physical rest? I don't think the virus was caused by the Lord, but this is no coincidence. Well, what is this rest about? It says in, four, in Hebrews 4.12 what the rest is. It says, for the word of God is living and active. Rest is getting yourself to a place where, where you hear his word that becomes active in you. And at the end of verse 12 of Hebrews 4, it says that the word of God divides between the soul and spirit judging thoughts, intentions, and motivations. And this is how I'm going to close out in prayer. The last six weeks, as you've been laboring to physically rest, even more important, he's been saying rest in your soul, in your emotions, and in your thoughts, because in that, my word is going to divide your thoughts and intentions. And whether you realize it or not, I think many of you know it, he has been judging your thoughts and intentions and rest to give you an upgrade so that we exit with this thing with more clarity and focus than we've had before. I want you today, I challenge you today to, to write down, get a physical piece of paper. Maybe you can go with your iPad or your iPhone or Android or whatever you have. But write down three things. And don't exit this lockout without doing this. Get before the Lord because I believe he's speaking to every one of us. And this is how I'm going to pray. One, what has he asked me to stop doing? Two, what has he said, this is what I want to focus on, and this is where your increased anointing is going to go. And number three, what has he asked me to pick up? And when you do those three things, your upgrade is now moving forward. He does nothing without his word of God, the prophetic coming in, and I'm giving you the plan that will equal your purpose. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for everybody that's listening to this now and in the future, and I thank you that you have been speaking to them the last six weeks. And whether they know it or not, today you're going to give them clarity. As we exit this thing, we are not returning to the same thoughts the same motivations that then drive our outward behavior. We are right now, in Jesus' name, start speaking to them whenever they listen to this. What is it that it might be that little thing in the back of my head, but today's clarity, I'm to stop this because I need it for my upgrade. What is it that I need to keep going on that you're going to increase the skill level. You're going to increase the anointing. You're going to increase the revelation. And then what is it that maybe some of you, he's even saying, I want you to pick this up 
It's new as we start this decade. Holy Spirit, I pray you move on every person. And right now, give them the prophetic. And then show them the plan so that they can be upgraded. And I just commit this thing to you. And we release a new revitalized army of saints, as Matt Michael has talked about, into the 2020s that will will influence the kingdom of God wherever they're at. In Jesus' name, amen. You got anything else? Thank you. Thank you, Brian. I almost forgot again. Yes, if you would like to give, they're going to give you a number that uh, where you can text to give. And uh, we just, uh, we thank you for your partnership uh, in your giving. On the other end, if you are in need and you have uh, a need of day-to-day items, you need food, you need any of the day-to-day items that we can help you out on and be assistance to you, please reach out to us, send us a message on Messenger, uh, letting us know what, how we can help you, whether it's food or day-to-day items, because we want to be a part of the solution in your life and, and, and letting you fully understand the goodness news of the gospel so we got two things two opportunities for you if you want to give you want to be a part and partner with us in your giving they're going to give you a text to give number text the word give to the number that they're putting up and uh, that you can follow the instructions there and we want to thank you for uh, sowing into the ministry and for partnering with us in your giving through your giving we're able to help many people who are in need and actually not just telling them good news but bringing good news to them thank you for being a part and we look forward to seeing you next sunday next sunday may the 3rd at 11 o'clock we will open the doors we've got everything sanitized we've got everything clean for you and uh, so 11 o'clock we're uh, inviting the public in again to be a part of our of our live services and uh, we're looking at probably somewhere during mid-may to start back our small groups again our sunday school classes and so forth but next Sunday starting next Sunday going forward at 11 o'clock the worship service the main service in the sanctuary uh, children's church will begin right at 11 o'clock uh, in the children's church area so one of the big differences is that children's church and the main service uh, in the sanctuary will start at the same time at 11 o'clock so parents bring your children right on over to the children's Church area next Sunday at 11 o'clock, and we will see you on Sunday. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you, his countenance be lifted upon you, and give you great peace. God bless you. Mm-hmm.